Hello, fellow riders. This is the first installment of the Chasing Tales series. I'll be interviewing my friends, pro riders, and all-around influential people in the mountain biking world. Today we have a good friend of mine, Stan Jorgensen. We'll hear about how he got his start to mountain biking and discuss some things about the mountain bike scene today. Kick back, grab a beer, and listen in while watching Stan and I shred some single track. Hello, fellow rider. Hello, fellow rider. Stan Jorgensen. What's going on, my man? Just another beautiful evening here in Sacramento, California. Can't beat it. It's pretty crisp tonight. Super Winter has come. Winter has come quick here. Got all this smoke. Some nice fresh air. <laughs> Lots of particles. Oh man, it's rough. Yeah, I commute to work uh, every morning and every evening, and it's uh, it's been getting pretty bad lately. I feel like here in the valley, we've kind of been socked in with all this smoke from the fires up north, and to add the the cold on top of it has not made things easy for us. I really enjoy the uh, daily Instagram updates, nice one, seeing you riding to work. You know Either what's that or funny? Your coffee. <laughs> I try to figure out how to make it any like change things up a little bit with it, but there's really not much you can change up with your commute to work in the morning besides some coffee and donuts and you know a nice nice fall landscape. Well, you're riding to work, so that's cooler than most people. Pete's sitting in traffic. You know what's funny is I can actually get to work faster on my bike than I can in my truck because of how much traffic there is in the morning. Well, let's get into it. You're an athlete for Scott Sports. How'd you get involved with them? Yeah, um, been riding for Scott for the past five years now. So made a good relationship with them. Kind of got introduced with them um, when I was on the Free Hub Enduro team back in 2013 and 2014. Um, got introduced with them and they kind of canned the Enduro team and Scott brought me along and asked me to be a part of their team. So that's kind of how I got started there with them. I haven't nice. seen you in any Scotty Laughlin videos. What's up with that? <laughs> I think they might think we look too similar to actually <laughs> sync the video together. <laughs> might be a little confusing. Yeah, they'd be like, there's two Scotty Laughlins riding around. I don't know how we're going to do this. Well, well, Dane and I are twins, so I don't know, it, still, it still works out. <laughs> I'll never forget when I first met you guys. I wasn't sure who was who. So you both were in my phone for the longest time as Dane Peterson, <laughs> You're, and I would yeah. always get you two mixed up. <laughs> you told me this before. Oh, that was like when we went to Aspen for the EWS, and I actually Venmoed you the yep. rent, the money for the the condo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were you doing before you got onto Scott? How'd you actually get into mountain biking? So um, I grew up riding uh, yeah. motocross. Uh, did that for probably four or five years with my dad, started getting really into it, and uh, right. one day I went into my garage to go get my dirt bike, and I realized that my dirt bike was missing. Holy so shit. I freaked out, and you know, I immediately, I think I was like 13 at the time, or 14, and I went up to my mom, and I was like, Mom, where's my, where's my dirt bike at? And she's like, what are you talking about? Because I thought, you know, like usual, your mom moves everything around the garage. Yeah. And... Uh, Someone had stolen it. She left the garage open, and someone rolled it out, loaded the back of a truck, and that was it. This was in Sacramento area. Yeah, yeah, that was in my parents' house. Shit. So that was that was a huge bummer, and uh, it was kind of at that age in life where your parents are starting to kind of kick you out on your own, and you know they told me, well, you know we have insurance, but our deductible. Yeah is a thousand dollars and you know they value the motorcycle at a thousand dollars so it was a wash damn, damn. so sick. that was that and uh i was i think yeah i had to been 14 because i was just i was just almost able to work and i you know started riding my bmx bike more because that's all i had in the garage and i uh Dude, get wrong. was you know trying to get a new bike and i couldn't afford to buy a new bike so i kept riding my old diamondback uh joker it was throwback pegs front and rear oh yeah Throw. and uh yeah so i was at the bike shop and uh you know i was asking for a job and they were like oh well you know you're 
you're not 16, you're not really old enough to actually work here, but you know, we need a Grom to sweep, sweep the back of the shop. So that's kind of how I got started. And I uh, was sweeping the back of the shop, making a little bit of money here and there and was able to afford to buy a specialized P1. And that was kind of the, uh, the start to my mountain biking life. What shop and was this at? That was at Bob's Bicycle on uh, Fair Oaks and Sunrise. Oh, yeah. I bought a fuse. I bought a fuse back there in the day. Oh, okay. There you go. BMX days. Yeah. Oh. Hell yeah. Then I, uh, one day, a couple guys from the shop, they were into uh, this downhill mountain biking thing. And they'd always show me their bikes. And I was like, man, that looks crazy. It looks like a motorcycle. I mean, there's so much travel on those things. And one night they took me out for a night ride in Auburn and uh, yeah that was quite an experience but long story short I, I took a hold of it really quick and next thing you know like these guys are like dude like what what are you doing like you're hanging with us we've been doing this for years and I was yeah. like Shit, this is just like riding moto but with no motor to it so yeah so that was kind of how I did that and I'll never forget, I was actually, hadn't gotten, maybe I had gotten a downhill bike by then, but my buddy had a Norco A-Line, and uh, he sold it to me for super cheap, and uh, I was at Power Inn Skate Park one night, riding around, and here was um, Brad Benedict and Ryan Condershop. <clears throat> oh, shit. And I was on Low my hard I was on my hardtail, ripping around, and these guys were just clowning on me. I mean, they were on the <laughs> and They thought they were so sick, and they were just totally just giving me shit. And I'll never forget, I was literally sitting there in my car with my buddy, and here they, they come, ripping around the parking lot in their truck, and they hold up the issue of decline when it's Brad Benedict and Ryan Kondershoff on the X-Fusion team. And they're both doing their whips off the famous table on the Sea Otter downhill course. Yeah. And they look at me and they're like, support the industry, bro. And to this day, Ryan Kondershoff and I will always joke around about it because it was something <laughs> that I couldn't, I won't ever forget. I don't think he'll ever forget either. But yeah, and it's funny how little things like that are things that really get you fired up. And, you know, I was like, fuck those guys like i want to i'm gonna go out there and i'm gonna beat those dudes like i want to fucking be that guy you know i was like i want to be on the cover of a magazine i want to be you know i want to be someone someday you know so yeah, yeah from there i i just started racing mountain bikes gotten into downhill did like yeah. the, the the north star uh downhill series that was kind of like my first thing like 2007 i want to say back when so, it was actually a thing yeah oh man it was rad like the, the i just remember like the the trails actually having dirt between the rocks like i mean <laughs> there was obviously like their gnarly bits to it but like i specifically will never forget like riding gypsy where it was like amazing like so rad like old school gypsy before they added all the wood features and did all that wasted all their money with that oh man dude that's a crazy story throwing in brad benedict and ryan kondrashoff in there two legends yeah no it's cool it's uh this year at tds ryan actually raced and threw down some heater of times like I, he he smoked me on a few stages and <laughs> he was he was he was ripping so it's cool yeah i'm looking at looking at the results right now ryan kondrashoff got 11th on one of the stages 11th at tds is no joke no, oh, that's a and the crazy thing is like I mean the, all those times are all so stacked like you could be ten seconds back, and that's like twenty places, twenty thirty places sometime. more. Yeah, yeah. Like, Everyone, I mean, is so on it. I mean, that, and that's that's such a difficult race for a lot of people because it's the first real race of the year and it's one of the gnarliest races. I mean, it's yep, no joke. <laughs> and there's like I, I, there's there's such like pressure I feel like sometimes to like go all out because of all the fans and just like the way the trails are like you know people people might say like oh i'm just gonna chill but dude oh, you yeah. you start going down your That's run sick. and you start getting fired up and you're just like yeah trying to pin it 
And it's it's cool too because I mean at the top you know everyone's you know super mellow having a good time I mean at least you know our crew is but uh, <laughs> you know everyone's acting like it's no big deal but I know deep down everyone's like fuck oh god like that guy's got ten seconds on me <laughs> damn that kid yeah. just put, like, five into me on that last stage like oh shit I need to turn it up everyone know? everyone tries to play cool and then like the times get posted and everyone's fucking rushing over there it's like <laughs> come on yeah there's like the the horde of people over the top of the computer screens yeah. trying to <laughs> take pictures of the results to see yeah. where they're at you know yeah we're right on I think that's a good segue into the next yeah. next topic so what would you like to change about mountain biking either the industry the bikes really anything anything's fair game here uh that's yeah, I think there's a lot to be said there but I, I think there's a there's a big shift that's happening currently in the mountain biking world of this whole um, social media thing you know it's it used to be when I was getting into racing is it's you know you proved yourself by who you were at the race right I mean it was who you were at as a racer, it was your race results, it was you know how you conducted yourself, there was a lot involved. So that was primarily like how you got your sponsorship and how you got your recognition. And I feel like today, social media is so much more heavily involved with who you are as a person in the industry. And I think from a company's perspective, it's a lot to be said because you can actually calculate an ROI for, for example, right? Like you can determine, you know, who someone is as an influencer based off obviously their likes and, you know, the yeah. views that they get on their videos and all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier as a company. I mean, looking at someone and saying like, oh, you know, Sam Hill's selling millions of nuke proof bikes because he's absolutely destroying the, uh, the EWS scene is, you know, it's not, not true. I mean, you, people aren't out there buying <laughs> obviously you're gonna have your your crowd of people that you know are insistent upon riding their flat pedals and you know yep. doing the, the the sam hill lifestyle but you know i, I think that they're like i said it's it's a new Whoa. world and uh it's social media now it's just it's, it's huge it's, totally of course of course i can't quite agree with you completely coming from my perspective but i definitely think that there might be like too much of a focus on it sometimes totally uh, because there's oh, ways to cheat yeah. right like you could go and buy followers and that oh, gets yeah. the ball rolling right it's like a yeah. snowball effect you that know? It's like, and that and like you know those guys the fastest people in the world or you know the guys at rampage um and like maybe not even the top level athletes but just like kind of local hometown heroes those are the guys who are really like pushing the sport sometimes and totally. yeah they're raising the bar all the time i mean it's it's not you know it, it, i mean it's like the youtube guys you know it's like sometimes you're like who the hell are these guys right <laughs> which in a way kind of speaks better to the demographic of who's actually buying bikes in a sense but yeah i mean it, it's like i was saying like the snowball effect right like you could buy all these followers and you could have you know fifteen thousand followers and if you're joe schmo and you you know, click on this guy's profile and you're like, oh, wow, this guy's got 15,000 followers. That means that he's someone, right? Like, it's like automatically you're someone. It's not, it's not like it used to be where like, you know, you'd go, you go to a, you know, sea otter as a beginner and, you know, you go to the race and then you look at what the pro times are and you see the top 10 or top sheet, right? The top sheet's always yeah. kind of a deal at sea otter, the top 30 riders. And you're like, oh, wow, look, oh, that guy's from my hometown, right? You're like, oh, cool. Who's that guy? Yeah, and that, that's kind of like the organic way of like figuring out who someone really was like in the scene. Yeah, in that same sense, even in the California Enduro series, it's like, you know, the top guys in the circuit, they're they're pretty well recognized. But like, you know, even if you're in the top 10 for pro, it's still a pretty big achievement. And no one knows who top 10 China Peak were or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah. Like you can get you can get more famous off a fifteen second video on your Instagram of you hitting a cutty in the parking lot, right? Like you can get <laughs> more recognition. I mean, it's like it's like like I spend a lot of time in the sum in the summertime um, up in Downeyville, and you know it's like people come up to me and be like, dude, 
oh my god, that video of you and Trail Peak was insane. Like you guys <laughs> were fucking flying, like nuts. Like, and I'm like, cool. When in reality, I'm like, that's awesome and all. But like, I wish someone would be like, oh dude, like, like you are such a fast racer. Like I always see you at the races, and like, man, it's like it's inspiring to like meet you and like get to know you, right? But it's like instead, it's like, oh dude, I saw you in that Trail Peak video, dude. It's so sick. Like <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> A different world we live in today. Yeah. So that would probably be one thing I'd change in mountain biking. One of the things I would like to change is get some more trails here in the States or California. Totally. I I can't really think of anything that new apart from a couple areas that have been built in California in the last couple of years besides like unsanctioned trails. Right. Like the newest that's thing. that's what it's all that's what it's all turned into is everyone yeah. rides these like illegal unsanctioned trails, right? Like that's why, that's why I've gotten rid of my Strava. I haven't posted anything on Strava in years. Cause it's like, I, I finally realized I was like, wow, I was like everything I ride, I should not be posting on Strava. <laughs> <laughs> totally. In our area, really yeah, like Auburn, Georgetown, you know, Tahoe in the summer. That's about it. Right, and Georgetown yeah. is kind of the new cool spot. I mean, yeah, I dig that place. But they're that's... not new trails; they've been there forever, and it's just. Yeah, I mean, we can all get we can all get over Auburn real quick. I mean, that takes a weekend there, and you're like, okay, <laughs> let's go ride something different. <laughs> and and it's like so weird because I think it's very specific to California. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's why personally, I spend so much time in Downeyville because I mean, it's places. There's so many undiscovered gems there that you know you really got to get out there for yourself and start kind of snooping around and reading maps and looking at you know where you want to go. Totally. Rather than finding, or riding new stuff, just right. finding some old stuff. Right. I mean, it's not like getting dropped off at the top in the shuttle and riding classic route it isn't a blast, but I mean, you can only do that a couple hundred times before you get you know bored out of your mind. I don't know, man. Butcher Ranch seems to never really get old. It's uh, always yeah. blast riding yeah, down you're right. that. You're, you're totally right. And what's cool, too, about Downeyville is, like, there's so many different seasons to it, right? Like, you like the springtime when, you know, everything's kind of thawing out and, you know, the trails are real good, but they ride kind of slow. And then, you know, the summer comes around and it gets all hot and hard packed. And all of a sudden you're just going mock stupid through the trees just <laughs> pinging your rims on every rock and <laughs> root around and then the classic comes through and you know everyone's practicing it so the trails get beat so it's like all these oh, new God. lines start forming and you know the trails yep. become like a, a whole new animal which is cool too like I, I, I dig it but there's also something about like going back into lakes basin and just you know getting lost and finding old school mining trails and Doing that, that's, that's, that's something in its own. Totally. Stan, great talking to you. Thanks so much for doing this. All right, man. Well, uh, thanks for getting me on here. It was uh, good to talk to you, good to discuss a few things. Take it easy, fellow rider. <laughs> thanks so much for listening, everyone. Tell me what you thought about this video in the comments. Also, let me know what questions I should ask or topics we should discuss next time.